Four years ago, Barack Obama rode a 20th century rags to riches persona into the White House to become a 21st century American president. But as he seeks re-election, there is still uncertainty about how much of his backstory can be backed up. Correspondent Doug McKelway looks at a new and exclusive report following several months of investigation by a reporting team at the Washington Examiner. The Examiner investigation raises questions about some established narratives in the early life, school, and work of President Obama. It calls the young Obama a child of privilege, not hardship. You see, Barack and I were both raised by families who didn't have much in the way of money or material possessions, but who had given us something far more valuable. Their unconditional love. I'm sure he had a difficult childhood, given the circumstances with his parents and so forth. But from a financial standpoint, a social standpoint, and so forth, it was not an underprivileged childhood. The examiner reports that the Indonesian neighborhood, Mentang, where his mother and stepfather raised young Barry Sotero, was the most exclusive in Jakarta. Later sent to live with his grandparents in Hawaii, where his grandmother was a bank vice president, he attended the exclusive Punahou School, then Columbia University, and later Harvard Law School. In his first job as a Chicago community organizer, he rejected more lucrative offers. To me, he was still the guy who picked me up for our dates in a car that was so rusted out. I, I could actually see the pavement going by in a hole in the passenger side door. But while he worked in the city's impoverished south side, he lived in exclusive Hyde Park. Of his 12 years as a lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School, Time Magazine said in 2008, quote, within a few years he had become a rock star professor with hordes of devoted students. But student evaluations obtained by the examiner tell a different story. In 2003, only a third of students recommended his courses. It steadily went down in the last five or six years that he was there. Uh, he was among the uh, lowest ranked professors. Nor did the future president leave any record of scholarly writings, while similarly credentialed colleagues wrote prolifically in law journals. He showed up for classes, he gave his lectures, and he was gone. The examiner found sharp contrast between Obama's memory of his legal work and the record of it. In Dreams from My Father, he wrote, quote, In my legal practice, I work mostly with churches and community groups, men and women who quietly build grocery stores and health clinics in the inner city and housing for the poor. But this document, filed with the Illinois Secretary of State, shows the young lawyer represented some well-heeled clients. In one case, he represented a politically connected preacher and real estate developer, Bishop Arthur Brazier, who had failed to provide heating and running water to 15 apartments in the dead of winter. Obama's client had all the tenants forcibly removed from the building, yet paid only a $50 fine under Obama's legal counsel. For all of his critics on the right, community organizer Obama left many colleagues on the left disheartened by selling out to the Chicago establishment. The late radical journalist Robert Fitch, who specializes in urban politics, said, quote, What we see is that the Chicago core of the Obama coalition is made of blacks who've moved up by moving poor blacks out. Diana Carter, a neighborhood activist, singled out the president's closest aide, Valerie Jarrett, for criticism. Jarrett was CEO of Habitat Company, a low-income real estate firm that made millions of dollars in part by leveraging federal programs like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit with subprime lending to poor people. Carter said, quote, they were never interested in poor people. They would sell poor people a bill of goods. The developers would profit from it. The political activists and political candidates, uh, like Obama himself, uh, would receive votes and, of course, political contributions. And it was a win-win for everybody, except the poor people. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Some argue that President Obama won office on his strength as a reformer, but the examiner found as a state senator, he rejected overtures to reform the Chicago machine. Quote, he made it pretty clear he wasn't interested in risk-taking or challenging the Chicago machine's lock on a lot of mechanics of government in Cook County in Chicago, said one frustrated former colleague. Mayor Richard J. Daley, the last of the big city bosses, built that machine by rewarding allies with patronage positions. Today, Obama's choice of aides suggests an unbreakable bond to that machine. Closest aide Valerie Jarrett, campaign manager David Axelrod, former chiefs of staff Rahm Emanuel and Bill Daly all cut their political teeth in the Daly machine. The legendary Chicago Tribune writer Mike Royko once penned this advice to mayoral candidate Richard M. Daly, the son of the big city boss, quote, Reward your friends and punish your enemies. 
It is a phrase the president used once to describe how Latinos should think about elections. We're going to punish our enemies and we're going to reward our friends who stand with us on issues that are important to us. To that end, the examiner says 31 Obama campaign bundlers received clean energy loans and grants totaling more than $16 billion. The auto bailout favored the United Auto Workers over secured creditors and eight of the ten states getting the most contracts from the stimulus program were heavily Democratic. Brett? Doug, thank you. The full report will be on the Examiner website tonight.